Seth O'Byrne, I am so glad that you made it here. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. I'm really excited, man. For those of you who don't know who Seth O'Byrne is, uh, let's just list your accomplishments. Like, number one, you know how to kickflip. Number two, <laughs> uh, you just became a new dad. Yep. And number three, you sold uh, almost a billion dollars in real estate. Yeah. So let's talk about that. T- take us back. Tell us how you got started. Tell us how you came to California, how you got influenced to get into real estate. Take yeah. us way back. So I grew up in Washington state, right? And so the weather wasn't so different from what we see behind us. You know, it was either, it looked like it, it just rained or it was about to rain or it's actively raining. And, um, you know, that wore on me. I think like everybody who lives in California, we kind of have a dream of this lifestyle of that, 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 that we look to get out of California life, kind of an easier life, a better life. And so as I was growing up in the Pacific Northwest, and I was going to uh, you know, a great high school up there, um, very supportive of the arts, and they paired me up with a college counselor from San Diego, for the University of San Diego in the 90s. And, and how old are you then? Like, yeah, I'm like 17, and I knew I wanted to be down in Southern California, <clears throat> and I looked at a lot of different places to do it. Um, but when I came down and I visited the University of San Diego and I was considering a place to go, it was partially the school, don't get me wrong, it's a great school, I, thank you USD. <laughs> we do a lot of business with USD. But it was more so than anything, an opportunity to go to the place I love. And so when I came down to San Diego, you know, I had a strong focus in um, creative writing. I was the editor of the literary magazine, which I was in high school and college. And I was producing a lot of writing content. I was writing for local magazines. Um, So story-based writing was was really an obvious choice for me because it's just where I gravitated towards. I love creating and sharing stories. And then as I was going to the University of San Diego, I realized two things very quickly. One, even though I wanted to be an English professor in a knitted sweater, you know, quoting Shakespeare to kids, uh, I wasn't going to be able to own a house in San Diego if I did that. So I had- How early did you realize that on as you were going through that part? About sophomore year when I moved off campus and had to pay my own rent for for an apartment. I was like, I don't think creative writing is going to get me to stay here near the beach. And so I started looking at other options. It was definitely a financial decision, but residential real estate um, happened on accident. You know, as I was going to USD and, you know, living in Mission Beach in a small little smelly studio apartment, which was all I could afford, you know, I I got a weekend job working at the front desk. If you remember fax machines, I I was working with fax machines, sending and receiving faxes and making coffees for top producing agents at the age of uh, yeah, 19 years old. And so I immediately saw these unbelievably impressive people um, you know, selling real estate, being involved in real estate, and really making enormous lives for themselves based on their hard work. And it was really inspiring for a young kid to see this. Um, and, and that's then how did you? Started. And then how did you make that? I mean, that, that itself, and I mean, the transactions were different back then. Yes. Was, you know, internet wasn't around, or was the internet around back then? Not really, no. Uh, so so the, the whole, type of way people sold real estate back then was totally different than what it is now. So, yeah. so when you decided, when you when you were there and you were 19, when you were like, when did, when was that decision? It was like, I want to do this. Yeah, it was interesting. I was listening to a podcast very recently by uh, the founder of LinkedIn on this pod, podcast I listened to, Mind Body Green. And- um, Mind Body Green. <laughs> a little shout out. He was talking about how so many of the times the epiphanies that happen in people's life are actually several epiphanies in one. There's not really that great kind of, we would love it as people who love video, that cinematic aha moment. But for me, it was a series of realizations. The first of which was, I wasn't gonna leave San Diego and I was gonna find a way to stay here. Um, So that was a financial decision. The second was when I started working in residential real estate, I was also interning at CB Richard Ellis and ACI Commercial, which is San Diego's largest apartment brokerage. And I was heavily involved with commercial real estate. And I thought I wanted to wear a suit and go to work every day in commercial real estate. And I thought that was my space. But then the, a mentor who I started working for, a guy who's still very successful in San Diego, Peter Middleton, um, he hired me as an intern to redesign his logo. And I used my knowledge of graphic design to do it. And in the process of being in his office and getting to know the people working on his team and seeing the energy and the excitement, it was, uh, a very, very salient experience for me to see something where everybody in that office was so passionate about the fact that they were in charge of their own destiny. And that was really the beginning of my kind of my love affair with entrepreneurship. 
this sense that, you know, in a concrete jungle world that we live in that looks nothing like the safari, nothing like, you know, the jungle, we can still be cavemen, right? Yeah. We can still just do it. We come up with an idea and go club that elephant or whatever, you know. Now, I'm, I'm vegan, so I'm not, I'm not saying like animal <laughs> cruelty here, but, but you know what I mean? Like the same concept that you can come up with an idea and by your hard work and creativity make it possible. Residential real estate seemed like the most obvious industry for me to make a name and prove myself. But it, like you said, it didn't happen sort of overnight, right? So how long have you been doing this? You know, I started making coffees for realtors in 2003. And so today's 2000. 15 years. 15 years. Yeah, so it took you 15 years to become that overnight success, you know, because out of the blue, you, yeah. your name's all over the place yep. and like, you know, boom. But, it's, but you've been in the industry, you've been grinding for 15 years. Yeah, it, I always say, you know, our team is the tale of two teams, right? We had the team before the recession and then the team after the recession. And, and, and the recession, like so many mishaps um, or unfortunate situations that I've been through in my life, they are always more pivotal than my successful moments. Losing everything, having to restructure my team, which in 2008, I was 26 years old. I had 15 full-time employees. I was one of the number one agents in Remax in the country, in all of America, uh, at 26. I just bought a ocean, you know, right off the ocean property and a super fast car and I had everything. And it was amazing and I was always speaking at events and everyone was like, oh Seth, he's the up and comer, he's gonna do this, he's gonna do that. My head was the size of Texas, <laughs> so egotistical. I just thought that I had everything. And then the recession took everything away but it gave me the gift of humility, which now is one of the most defining characteristics of our team. Is, Absolutely. Is connections to other people and humility and the understanding that when you serve the public through business, you have a responsibility to help people on the way up and also serve people on the way down. I love it. Um, and so when I went through that and I lost 14 and a half employees of my 15, um, I say half because I could only pay one of the employees like part time. Gotcha. <laughs> I borrowed money from my mom in the middle of the recession to pay my assistant. Uh, I mean, it really got bad there for a while. It allowed me to look at my business model and look at what I was doing and completely reassess. Companies in their uh, maturity very have a very difficult time reassessing what they're doing, whether or not it's working in the business environment, and whether or not it's working on a whole. But there yeah. was different things that affect, I mean, yeah. that time was the recession, today there's technology, right? You've mm -hmm. got a different sort of catalyst that's sort of shaking up the game. It's not yes. that 2008, you know, there's no buyers, so it's tough to do business. But today it's like, you know, if you have your MLS book, you know, mm -hmm. you think you're gonna sell houses just with your MLS book, that's you know, that's done too. So there's all yeah. these different disruptions. So talk to us about that. So, yeah, I mean, but, but before we go there, I actually yeah. wanted to cut down and take a step back yeah, and, yeah. and talk about, do you remember your first deal that you did, your first commission check? 3030 Suncrest Lane, unit 203. Oh, wow, you remember the address so well. So what was it, you take us through like, you know, was it a tough transaction or what was it like to get that first deal? Yeah, it, it was way too easy. And oh. um, I think everybody who went through the run up to the recession when the market was crazy, it was too easy for anybody in real estate, but it was a great feeling. Um, again, it's, you know, you come up with an idea on a napkin yeah. and then when you receive a paycheck you can put into your account, you're like, wow, I really did this. Yeah. And so it was super exciting. It was a phenomenal experience. It was a little lackluster in that, you know, it was a new construction project, it was a condo conversion. And so I just signed in the, 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 our, our clients. They bought the property and the builder did most of the, the, the heavy lifting. But it was, a, it was a great moment. What was really sweet to me though, was that client then referred me three different clients that bought in the same building in the next two months. Oh wow. And so my first quarter I did four transactions and what it did for me, which I always coach young agents about, is you need to have things that, that boost your confidence. Because this business is very difficult. Let's, let's just be straight. You know, it's, only three to seven percent of the people who try this business succeed. The other 90 plus percent all fail in the yeah. first five years. And having early confidence and early confidence boosters was, was, was dramatic to me. My fifth, transactions was, fifth transaction was an oceanfront property for two million dollars. And that was really the exciting transaction. Oh, wow. Because I got that through networking, I proved myself. You know, I was brand new to the business, I was wearing my dad's suit that so I had tailored. That, that's in year one, you, you got a $2 million listing in year one. Absolutely, wow. listed it, marketed it, negotiated, closed it. Oh wow, that's amazing. The owner knew I was green, but he knew that I really wanted it and I was gonna work really, really hard, probably harder than a lot of the people that have been in the business for a long time. So 
Yeah, that was. And, and so now, fast forward. I mean, you're doing <clears throat> eight-figure properties. Yes. You know, all across the country. Uh, you know what? What's the difference between selling a, say, a seven-figure or even a less than that property versus an, you know, a ten million dollar plus? Yeah. Property. So the transaction's not so different. The nuts and bolts of how we do business, I think, in a three hundred thousand dollar transaction or a thirty million dollar transaction, are structurally fairly similar, right? Just just like you would build a house somewhat similar than you would build a three story house or a four story house. You build a mid rise somewhat similar to how you build a high rise. The foundation is essentially the same. The difference is, uh, I believe, the marketing, and that's that's critically different. Now, if I represent a home buyer on a large property, it's pretty similar. It's almost indistinguishable. Uh, longer home inspections, bigger houses, more pools, like that kind of stuff, right? On the listing side, how you sell that property to a hyper affluent, sometimes secretive demographic to try to find that buyer for a $30 million house, that process is vastly different. And, and that's really where our skill set has been honed. Um, is how to find a hyper wealthy. And, and I think what, what um, sort of the secret source or sort of the, the backstory that, you know, it's, unless you kind of get to know you, yeah. it's, it's the storytelling background, it's the marketing background that you had, it's the, you know, being in the business for a long time. It's kind of that combination of yes. all that that's really kind of helped you kind of get to this level of success where you're able to get a $30 million listing and able to win, uh, what was that award, a Realtor of the Year? Realtor of the Year, and yeah, we, we've had an amazing last six months. We, you know, the Association of Realtors gave us, you know, recognized me as Realtor of the Year, which was huge. Yeah, congrats um, on that. Thank you, yeah. thank you, dude, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah it was awesome. Um, I was like, it meant a lot to me, because since I was a kid, I've always looked up to that award, and it meant a lot to me for almost 20 years. So that, and we were nominated for two Telly Awards, which wow. are, um, video commercial awards for for two of our uh, video commercials, our films that we did about our properties. That was amazing because we were so focused on the creativity and the and, and the work behind our video marketing. Um, and, and you're just, you're big on video right now. I mean, yes. Tech, you're, you're, you're going all in on video. We're it's bullish, funny. it's where we put everything. I mean, I, I there was this one saying that, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, and if a picture's worth a thousand words, what is a video worth? Yeah. Right, so, I mean, so you really feel that, that video is so valuable, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, you're, you're, the content that you're creating is, mm -hmm. is really high end, it's really, almost theatrical, almost cinema, oh, Hollywood, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's you know. It is. And, and that's for selling, and, and it makes sense because these are very high valued assets. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's surprising that no one has been doing it before. So talk to us about video, talk to us about technology and how yeah. you're kind of seeing what's happening. Today. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my, my story is no different than others on a real estate side. You know, I worked hard, I struggled, I went through problems, I got to where I, are, where, where I am. Where we've taken, uh, uh, you know, I think we've done our best to stay ahead of the pack, and I think we've taken a little bit of a turn off in our own way as a real estate team is technology and social media. That's really, that's what runs our company now. How social media plays into real estate in our real estate business for both our clients and ourselves um, is really twofold, right? There's, there's awareness and branding. So there's getting your messages out there on a consistent basis with your consistent audience. So I have 22,000 followers who follow me on Instagram and collectively we get between 75 and 150,000 weekly organic views of the content that I'm putting out. So on average, that's somewhere around um, like five million views a year. Um, it's an enormous audience that we're able to touch. And what, what we did was we realized that in a business like residential real estate that's primarily high trust, uh, you, you do business with someone you already know or a referral of someone that you trust. Or if you can't do that, the third option, which is what social media provides us the opportunity to do, someone that you've been familiar with online for a long time. Gotcha. And so when, when I tell people that we do a tremendous amount of business on Instagram and we get a lot of clients from Instagram, it's not someone who saw an ad that I ran or someone who stumbled onto my account for the first time. It's someone that started following me in 2015 and followed every single thing that I've done from 2015 to 2018 and said, you know what? I know this guy, I know his kid, I know his wife, I know that they have a cute little dog, I know that they just went on vacation to Hawaii, and I know that he just listed this property that's in the neighborhood I'm looking. I know this guy, like I know him on a personal level, I know Seth on a personal level, and I know his business on a professional level. I like how he manages both. I'd like this person to represent me on this purchase or sale. Um, that's where it works, is it creates a sense of familiarity, and I, I believe video 
does the same thing. It's a personal brand that's able to go sort of much further than you're able to go on a, on a one-off basis. Right? Yeah. So you can, you have this reach. Absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 you know, you probably would not talk to a financial advisor on the phone in a 30 minute phone conversation and just give them access to all of the money that you have in the world. Right. You would probably want to meet him two or three times, you know, go to go with he or she to a coffee shop and learn a little bit about their life and talk about, you know, your personal life and just get to know them on an ongoing basis. It might take six months to a year to get comfortable enough with a financial advisor to give them money. Right. Sure. Uh, a real estate agent's no different. But in today's world, there's two things that are happening. There's a strong demographic trend where we are cocooning as a culture. We go to work and then we come home and then we bury our faces into iPads and iPhones. And we're not going out so much to the bars and the restaurants and being social. Dating itself is done on iPhones rather than out in public. And so now that we're becoming a more insular uh, society, socializing is happening on screens. And so n whether it's dating or, or business, we have to be interacting in this new paradigm, right? And, and so that's where we believe our interactions have to really soar and succeed. And what can you, what would you say for those agents that are trying to come up and, and, and get uh, grow their businesses that mm -hmm. are not sort of deeply involved in video or social media or embracing technology? Do you feel that they could still make it, or do you feel that in a, you know in a few years things will be very very different? I don't think they can make it. I, I, I was asked to give a speech in Las Vegas for Sotheby's International Realty Global, and there, there was about a thousand people in the room. It was a big talk on social media as a piece of marketing. You know, my first statement, which I believe strongly, is social media is not part of a marketing plan anymore. Social media is the marketing plan. Wow. Print is secondary. Radio is secondary. Belly to belly, almost secondary, because belly to belly happens after someone's seen you on social media, they've followed you, they've gone to your website. So you know, what's belly to belly? Belly to belly is face to face. Oh, gotcha. So, uh, yeah, you still got to yeah. meet someone, right? and you still gotta get face to face, belly gotcha. to belly gotcha. with each other, right? And it's an old real estate term. And then, sorry, belly to belly, like your navels have to be connected? Or no, like just that's like... real weird. Okay, that's, gotcha, okay, that's okay, no, gotcha. yeah, I don't, that's, yeah. it you, matters you, what kind of business you're trying to get. Okay, gotcha. Right. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> but like the belly to belly is right, it's like we're yeah. sitting here, we're hanging out, yeah. we're having a cocktail. This, you're saying that this is more rare. Yeah, it's know? more rare. And it used to be, you know, and it is to some degree still, there has to be physical activity. You have to get to know somebody on a personal level. But here's what's crazy. Here's where, here's where we reach this tipping point in lead generation and personal sales. It used to be that social media is what you would look at as, a, an, as an addition to understand someone that you met and you got their business card at a networking event. Now what it is, is it's usually the last thing you look at before you make a purchasing decision about whether or not you're going to hire an advisor or buy a piece of property or get to understand the business person that you're going to be doing business with. Someone meets you at a networking event, they're, if they're interested at all at doing business with you, they're going to start interacting with you on social media for one to three to six months before they do anything. Most of the people I do business with, I've been following them on social media for over a year whether it is selling a product, like we sell luxury real estate, or selling your business, um, you have to have the, the uh, wisdom and the philosophy that what you're doing in creating content on social media is trying to create an ongoing conversation with an audience that you're not, you don't know who they are. So you're essentially just putting content out that is one side of a communication, right? So there's a, you're going like, here I am on vacation. Here I am, you know, working for a charity that matters to me. Here I am with my team in the office in the conference room, working hard and grinding it out. And you show all of it. You show the good, the bad. You yes. Know, DJ Khaled, you know, you put his, um, you know, his wife gave birth on Snapchat. You yes. Know? So I mean, I mean that went viral, went crazy, yeah. you know. And then, but then the problem is, you know, at the same time, you know, you you put so much time and effort into a platform, and yep. then you that platform dies. Oh, right. Yeah. So whether it's Vine or whether it's Snapchat and <laughs> or Facebook or Facebook, you know, yeah. and you yeah, hundreds of thousands of people just you know deleted their Facebook accounts over the last couple of months. Yeah. So 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 talk to me about you know the, there is that constant content creation and storytelling 
but then the vehicles you, you I know you talk a lot about Instagram and Instagram is a fantastic platform yes and, and Facebook got a, a deal when they bought it but but what about the new stuff what about YouTube what about uh, other things that are coming up yep. what about vlogging the, you, know, yeah. you know Gen Y uh, Gen yeah. Z what are they yeah. doing so yeah. talk to us about how you kind of created that that's a, an absolutely great question and and I think when I look back at my you know 15 16 years in the business what I what I believe that they have been defined by is a willingness to double down on something that's working, but always keeping an ear open to tectonic shifts that are happening. I first crested $10 million in annual sales using Craigslist. Before Zillow was, was what Zillow is, before there was a Zillow, consumers had no way to log on and look at real estate themselves unless an agent sent them listings. So we recognized that we could post properties for sale on Craigslist. Mind you, this is 2005. Zillow didn't really come into play until 8, 2008. We could post photos of properties on Craigslist. People would contact us to see those houses. They might buy those houses. If they don't buy those houses, we have an opportunity to sell someone on why we should be their agent and sell them something else. We sold 60 homes in one year based on posting free ads on Craigslist. On Craigslist. Wow. And I got really started to understand how to write HTML, I started hiring college kids from the University of San Diego. I'd pay them a dollar a post. We were posting 200 ads a day on Craigslist. And you know we became an enormous top producer. Craigslist went away because Zillow swallowed it. Facebook back in the day used to be $5 for an ad. I was the, one of the very first advertisers in San Diego County in any industry. It was $5 an ad. You, there was no pay-per-click. There was no CPC. Um, I would post photos of famous actors and characters and Mr. T and A Pity the Fool Who Doesn't Buy a House with Seth O'Byrne. Click here to go to my website. And I sold almost $40 million in real estate one year based on Facebook ads that cost me an average of about $10 a day in total spend. Wow. Um, then that all went away because Coca-Cola and Nike and all these giant companies blew up the rates and it became so expensive. There's no way a small business owner could do that, right? So then it became organic delivery, then it was YouTube, now it's Instagram, paid delivery of Instagram ads is enormously successful. Then it was text marketing, text marketing really defined 2015 for me. I was selling so much real estate by creating this, these, this text marketing, hyper-targeted targeted text marketing. But you're always, it seems like you're always on top of the pulse, like, and, and is, that, the goal. is that intuitive? What is that sort of, how are you able to sort of understand the flow yeah. of capturing the market? That's a great question. You cannot understand the consumer unless you are one. Right. And that's a defining difference. So when I speak to a room, I just spoke to Sotheby's in, in Palm Springs on social media marketing. I'm speaking to a room of primarily 55 to 70 year old, very successful older agents. You know, they all ask these questions, you know, okay, so who do I hire to do my social media? If you're asking that question, you're lost. Yeah. You've lost it all. You are never going to succeed if you're asking that question because you need to consume the media to understand the media. You, 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 this is a two-way road, social media. This is a conversation, it goes both ways. So what I do is I'm a consumer of social media. I'm constantly on Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and I'm constantly posting stories and consuming other people's stories and getting to understand it. So I change the way that I market when I change the way I consume media. I myself was drifting over to Instagram from Facebook just when everybody else was. And what I was seeing was Facebook, especially around the election, the 2017 election, it had all become highly politicized, so angry. It was very negative information coming at people. And our social media platforms, by design, are meant to give us a reprieve from the day-to-day -day grind. You know, you look at all these cars here, they're stuck in traffic, they're racing to work. They've got a boss that they don't like. They're having a hard time at home. What do they do? They go to their phones and they go, I'm gonna give myself a little break. You know, our phones are essentially, I think, a, a new version of what used to be the smoke break. An escapism, a little bit of a... It's escapism. So, so what had happened was Facebook had gotten so clogged with negativity and highly politicized and uh, religious views and things that real, uh, people were going to social media specifically to avoid those things there became a mass exodus that could be measured in millions to the Instagram platform. And I saw that and predicted that because I was part of that same culture. Gotcha. So, so I think- being if, a consumer, as, as understanding the flow of how part to attract your consumers. Absolutely, well. and, 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 and same thing with Instagram story. I, I find myself now navigating almost exclusively to Instagram story. It's where all the 
It's where all the views are coming from. It's where all the interest is coming from. And that is not at all the future of Instagram. That is the current present of Instagram. I think Instagram story is where all of our business is happening. No, I read a thing from Mark Zuckerberg recently that the news feed which they created and the story which they stole from Snapchat essentially, yep. the stories are gonna overtake news feed by the end of 2018. So more and more people are gonna be watching stories than the news feed can yes. be on the whole of both platforms. Absolutely, which yeah, is yeah. We, we, we will spend at times, this is gonna be crazy, we will spend sometimes between five to ten thousand dollars a month investing in produced story posts. Wow. That's 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 our story budget, not our newsfeed budget. Wow. That's how tripling down we are on stories, and it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of um, human reasons why stories are great. Um, I will tell you, I am currently negotiating on a transaction just north of us for six million dollars. The lead came from Instagram Story. Amazing, Seth, thanks for being here. That was yeah. such valuable content. And you know, what does things look like for you in the future? It's 2018, and what does the Seth O'Byrne and the Seth O'Byrne team look like in, in the next five to 10 years? At, at the beginning of this year, we decided um, that we're gonna do two things, and we're gonna try to put all of our energy into those two things, right? So number one is we are absolutely obsessed with how to create video marketing for our properties that actually creates a sale. Not just interesting, not just stirring the spot or stirring the pot or creating some sort of interest, something that actually creates purchasing decisions. So we're gonna dive deep into the psychology behind why our video works and how it can work better. We're gonna use that as our sales tool, number one. And number two, we're gonna start doing a lot of vlogging. So we're gonna start bringing people all around with us on a day-to-day -day basis to show them what a day in the life of the O'Burn team is. Um, and what, but what both of those things do is they bring the consumer and the buyer and our clients closer and closer and closer to what we're doing. And so, and so by bringing your clients and by vlogging every day, what is the goal? I mean, you already got real top of the year. So where, is there any sort of accolades that you're trying to achieve? Is there any sort of uh, you know, fiscal goals that you're trying to reach? Yeah, our goal is to sell a quarter billion a year in real estate. That's our goal, 250 million a year in real estate. That's, that's been very much our goal for three years to hit it. And we've, we've uh, you know, four years ago we hit 100 million and we're very proud of that uh, for annual sales. But we believe that we have the uh, infrastructure and the talent to do it. We have, uh, I think, every bit of ability to do it. We have the marketplace to do it. Um, I think that's the future. I would say um, the only addition to that, which is a really exciting development for our team, is we are now being hired from developers and other realtors all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in San Diego, you got you know the Pacific Gate. You yes. Know, by Boza, you got Zephyr's the Park. Zephyr the Park, which is you know one of the the most expensive you know buildings, condominium buildings in in San Diego. Yeah, we've got two projects we're working on in Costa Rica. Um, we've got two major developments that we're working on in Oahu and Hawaii. Wow. We've got a project we're working on in Beverly Hills. We're gonna be in Steamboat, Colorado in three and a half weeks, doing a rebrand for Sotheby's Steamboat. Um, so yeah, we're working on stuff we're really excited about. It's just really cool excited. to be able to you know, get flown around the world now to share the magic of the Auburn Team video focus. And, and to and share the I'm stories sorry. of, of yeah. what, you're, what you're creating. Yeah. Seth, thanks again for being on. Cool. That was awesome. Thanks yeah, for such a for great sure. interview. Appreciate it, buddy.